Executive Director of the Lemelson Foundation. And for those of you who don't know the Lemelson Foundation, we are a private family foundation based in Portland, Oregon in the United States. We work on improving lives through invention. And uh, we do that uh, because our founder, Jerry Lemelson, was one of the most prolific inventors in the United States. Um, he knew from his own inventions the power of invention to change lives and to bring the future, a better future, into reality. And so we work using invention as a way to have positive social impact, both in the U.S. and also in the developing countries. In our work outside of the U.S., we focus primarily on um, improving the lives of the poor, using invention as a way to do that. But inventions have their greatest impact when they turn from ideas into products, into businesses who can deliver those products. And so we believe very firmly in the power of entrepreneurship and the creation of new businesses that can provide products that will have positive social impact. We think about it in terms of what we call impact inventing, hence the name for this session. Um, impact inventing for us means that uh, an idea is one that will turn into a product that has positive social impact, is done in a way that is environmentally responsible because those physical, tangible inventions that we create are both the things that can do positive good for our relationship with the planet, but also can be the ones that leave a lasting legacy of damage to our planet. So environmental responsibility is key to impact inventing and also we feel that uh, those products should turn into financially sustaining or sustainable endpoints so that they can be taken up and used by others and hence achieve their intended impact. So impact inventing is critical. Along the way, we end up supporting the path, which is we work to inspire and educate a next generation of inventors, as well as to help support an ecosystem that will allow them to take their ideas to fruition so that ideas that can address basic human needs can result in impact in communities and also so that ideas that allow people to enhance their own livelihoods can allow them to lift themselves out of poverty and improve their own situations. So we focus primarily on tangible products, so inventions that involve hardware and why do we focus on that? Because in fact the big problems that are out there are going to require some invention around tangible products, so whether it's solving health issues, sanitation issues, access to clean water, food security issues, they all require invention as well as innovation around business models, et cetera. So we focus on tangible products and, and you'll hear a bit about that today. The other thing to think about is that tangible products are actually essential for a healthy economy. So what we do in terms of creating inventions and products that can improve lives also results in a strong economy contributing to both the creation of jobs, as they, companies of that sort tend to be the catalytic components of an economy, but also creating the basis for manufacturing and trade that are essential to strong economies going forward. But the challenges for taking ideas that turn into tangible products into a business and moving them forward are greater and in some cases different than those of others that are just delivering services or perhaps even delivering software-based products. Today, uh, we have three terrific panelists who are experienced in both the challenges and successes of bringing solutions to those who need them while building viable, enduring businesses, which is the path to actually ensuring that products have their intended impact. So I'm going to um, begin by introducing our panelists and uh, just tell you a little bit about them. Then we're going to plunge into a bit of a dialogue. And at the end, um, I hope that we have some time for questions and certainly for a bit of wrap-up uh, summarizing. So on my left is Paul Basil, as you heard, who's CEO and founder of Vilgro. And he has provided the vision for incubating social enterprises and shaping the social innovation ecosystem in India for over 15 years. And during that time period, has incubated over 100 innovative enterprises and creating more than 4,000 jobs. I'm probably actually low on these figures based on what I heard last night, touching the lives of, I think, around 10 million people at this point. And so also been really key in helping to shape an ecosystem here in the community that uh, supports social entrepreneurship. Uh, Paul also serves as a member of the governing board of the India Society of Business Incubators Association and was a co-founder of Vilfarm Agri Solutions, so a private enterprise making superior and sustainable agri-inputs for farmers in rural India. 
Paul's been honored in a number of ways for the great work that he's done, um, including that he is an Ashoka Fellow and also has uh, been conferred the Samaj Siva Bhushan Award and the Star Entrepreneur Award. So very pleased to have Paul on the panel today. I'm going to turn now on my right and have Harish Hande, who is uh, founder and CEO of Selco. And Selco uh, has been an organization that has brought light and energy to thousands of homes and schools throughout India. Through Selco Foundation, he's also exploring how to launch um, the next generation of innovators focused on sustainable social impact, as well as uh, looking at it in the context of different settings, all the way from education through incubation. Uh, Selco, uh, Harish has been honored for his work uh, extensively as well, working with Selco, including the Raman Magsaisai Award, as well as the Ashton Award and the Accenture Economic Development Award. I won't go into the full list. Um, all our panelists here are really distinguished. Um, Vijay Simha, who is on my far right here, is CEO of One Breath. Vijay has a long history of creating new products, new markets, and new enterprises in sectors ranging from as diverse as automotive parts to medical technologies and the range in between. At One Breath, he is uh, working to address the challenge of respiratory illnesses and uh, bringing suitable technologies to those who can't afford them, uh, the current options. He's also a member of FITSI's Advisory Council on Innovation and the FITSI uh, Health Services Committee, which is actively pursuing an inclusive agenda for innovation, as well as conducting the Innovation Sandbox, which brings cutting edge scientific research to impact society through teaming up scientists, entrepreneurs, and business professionals. So I'm very pleased to have this distinguished panel for our discussion. So I'm going to start uh, first with Vijay um, and turn to you as an example of an entrepreneur currently working on building a company that is focused on addressing the needs in resource poor communities. And my understanding is that One Breath started with a concept that came from a couple of U.S. students and has migrated now to a, a company that is full-fledged here in India and that you're leading forward. Can you tell us a little bit about the company, the inventions behind it, and a bit about both the challenges and successes along the path that One Breath has taken so far. Sure, Carol, thanks. Uh, I'll just start off with uh, this young bright-eyed boy who uh, thought intimacy with nature was basically through science. And uh, my journey has been extensively uh, that, basically that uh, I've been looking at science as a way of understanding oneself. That's a personal uh, philosophy. Uh, but more than that is that uh, we have uh, not really understood the real impact of how these sciences can, uh, can actually make life easier for a lazy person like me. Um, the fact is that most of the discoveries that we've had uh, in the recent past have been how we've been able to be able to live with nature sustainably uh, on a long term without really upsetting or uh, trying to swim uh, against the tide and uh, cause a lot of uh, environmental as well as uh, life damage, stress damage. Um, I was at Omidyar uh, for a while uh, doing a sabbatical and trying to build a pipeline for healthcare uh, investments. And Omidyar's objective was basically to look at uh, uh, technologies or healthcare technologies that could be leveraged in the frontline uh, healthcare system and enable them to perform their job more uh, effectively and efficiently. Then comes, comes along you know, Matt Callahan, a doctor at Stanford University, who with his invention of uh, turning around uh, a ventilator or ICU technology um, upside down. And uh, he said, this is kind of disruptive, but uh, I don't know how people are going to take to it. Uh, people will take to it because they don't mind uh, whichever way you actually uh, um, uh, perform the procedure as long as it gives you the right outcomes or the uh, beneficial outcomes, but regulators are going to be, uh, you know, very upset about it. So um, we looked at the technology and I said, hey, I mean, there are two, three things which uh, uh, is, is very interesting about this technology. One is this trend and this, this dream that we had that we would leverage the power of the physical constants. I'm getting a little uh, geeky on that. Uh, <laughs> but we would leverage the power of the physical constants to be uh, the control system uh, constraints. Okay, now what does this mean? Um, 
we, we have uh, a number of physical laws and constants here, and we leverage these uh, physical laws to be a kind of uh, what the Japanese call uh, uh, a jujutsu on technology, which is use the power of the technology, or power of the stream, uh, to power your equipment. And uh, definite advantages in that. Um, the technology promised three things, basically, one is ease of use and uh, minimalistic uh, kind of uh, engineering that was required. The next was that your control systems were more sophisticated and we could handle them with today's microprocessors available. And number three, it brought down the overall bill of materials and the complexity of the machines. So this is something that I believe would be the trend moving forward with most uh, equipment and devices because in the past we didn't have these kind of, uh, you know, uh, powerful microprocessors to be handled all these uh, uh, kind of algorithms. But uh, today, uh, with a very uh, minimalistic kind of setup, you will be able to produce uh, products that uh, are not lower in the uh, uh, cost of production or in the bill of materials, but also uh, more compact, wearable, and possibly uh, uh, smarter. <clears throat> so we set out and we said, okay, let's form a team and uh, build this product. And the journey's been good. It's been about one and a half years, probably one of the ambi most ambitious uh, programs in the time scale of medical devices. In about 14 to 18 months, we are building a product and we are pretty close uh, to uh, building the product and we should be having the product out um, and dedicated to all the ICUs across India um, by December 2015. Uh, share a couple of comments on how the ecosystem has either supported or created a challenge for One Breath in the point it's at now and sure. going forward. Yeah. Well, um, just to give you an overall picture and a big picture of what uh, critical care is in India is that it is uh, completely underserved. And the reason why it is underserved is obviously because of uh, the things that we've been talking about, shortage of doctors, shortage of critical care specialists, and shortage of the most important thing, uh, equipment and tools. And the reason why these uh, shortages do come up is because probably we, um, we can't afford much of the stuff around. Um, a critical care setup normally costs, it used to cost about a crore of rupees to set up one bed in, a, in, in an ICU. Uh, today the prices have come down with uh, low cost equipment and uh, fixtures. Uh, but ventilators, which is an important part of the uh, critical care setup, continues to remain uh, the most expensive equipment on the list. The success of being able to use a ventilator is not dependent upon the ventilator as it is, but it also depends upon the infrastructure that's available. So the design goals that came up as a part of our design process for ventilators that would probably serve the millions is based on the fact that it needed to address three gaps. One, the gap that is uh, related to the infrastructure and the inability of, uh, of equipment to work in a situation where there's no electricity, power, or even compressed air, or even maybe no oxygen. The other aspect that we needed to uh, address was the lack of uh, available skilled workforce in that particular area to be able to operate a ventilator successfully. And the third most important gap was uh, the affordability of being able to provide critical care services. Um, I think uh, we have successfully addressed uh, to a large extent all these three gaps. And uh, hopefully this would, uh, would result in an impact of an additional, I would say close to about a million and a half people every year in terms of being able to access uh, you know, critical care uh, of good quality now. Right. Yeah. So, Paul, um, your organization, Velcro, is deeply involved in accelerating the path to entrepreneurship for a variety of companies, including One Breath. And um, maybe you could tell us a bit about uh, some examples of companies that are using invention as a tool to have impact, and maybe speak a little bit about what kind of support you give and what you see as the missing pieces, both the needed pieces and missing pieces of the ecosystem as it stands. Right. Thank you, Carol. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, both Harish and, and Vijay. And we've been uh, humbled and fortunate to support One Breath in their journey to 
make uh, critical care uh, affordable and accessible in India. Um, so I think, um, le let me talk about two examples. And I think these are examples, not, not, not that um, I have a preference on these, but I just wanted to illustrate how some of these can create uh, really um, lasting impact. One company that, um, that I'm very excited about is a company called Nayam. All of you know that after the uh, a simple cataract surgery, you implant the lens, and then you actually need to wear spectacles after that. For many of people living in villages who are poor, who are disadvantaged, uh, cataract surgery doesn't solve the problem. You need to wear, continue to wear spectacles. And if those spectacles aren't available, for many it isn't, uh, it breaks and you know all these kinds of things happen. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. And then they get back to blindness, right? Many people working on the farms and places like that can't wear these spectacles and work too. So this company, what it does is a brilliant innovation. And what it does is it's created a lens which uses a particular type of a polymer and then you implant it in your eye and after two weeks of the surgery, you apply a ray of light over that polymer and there is you know, correction of vision that happens and then you ne don't wear, need to wear spectacles anymore in your life. You know, so you eliminating spectacles out of that equation. And I think that is fascinating, right? Uh, how this kind of innovation, and in a country like India, which has technical talent of a, an unbelievable kind, um, this has been kind of innovated at um, the National Chemical Laboratory, the most premier uh, institution which can support this kind of R&D work. So that's one example that you know, I'm extremely excited about. And, and, and the best part is uh, big institutions like Arvind, LV Prasad and places like that are starting to show interest and excitement over a in invention of this kind. And, and a strong belief is that that can now go across India um, over the next, I would say, it's, it's going to be a longer journey, but it's going to take uh, some time. But over the next five years, we can see it getting into the hands of people. If people like Arvind and others will buy into this. So that's one example. The other example, which I think is amazing, is the work done by Promethin. Um, many of you are familiar with it. Um, this is not cutting edge invention, right? But what is important is the power of the invention to create value for people. Milk. Uh, is stored, collected in, in, in village level cooperative societies. It needs to reach to a bulk milk chiller and that process normally takes uh, two and a half, three hours. If it extends by one more hour, the milk gets spoiled. So that's one issue in collection of milk. The second issue is because it's such an organized chain of procurement, the, the van that goes and collects milk actually collects it from very defined locations. So which means if you need to actually add a new cluster to that procurement chain is not very easy. What Prometheus has done with a simple thermal battery is that it has created rapid refrigeration of milk right at the village, right? So you pour milk, there's a good thermal battery which charges when there is electricity and discharges when there is no power. And invariably what happens is in the milking, the collection time, which is in the morning and late evenings, there is no power. And this chills milk right there. And once the moment you chill milk at the village, bacterial content doesn't multiply anymore. And you know how it actually contributes to uh, addressing milk losses, how it actually contributes to adding more farmers into the procurement chain of the dairy sector. What it has been done is very intelligently they've plugged into the organized dairy sector in India. And in the organized dairy sector in India is so organized that it becomes easy for an invention like this then to get uh, 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 creating impact on the lives of people. So, so those are two examples that I, I really wanted to highlight. Right. Could you maybe uh, give us a couple of comments uh, about uh, what companies like this need in terms of support and, and what kind of support Velgro itself gives, but also what you see around in the ecosystem that they need. Yeah. So so I think there are uh, four or five blocks of support that we're seeing these companies need. 
one really big block is um, this whole technical inputs, right? Uh, you're working at a pre-product stage. Uh, there's a whole technical block of inputs. This, the second input really is very early stage capital, right? Uh, and that is high risk capital. So the combination of grant, equity, uh, you know, that, that kind of seed funding. The third big piece that I'm seeing with um, entrepreneurs who are unlike Vijay, who hasn't built companies in the past, uh, they need a whole lot of mentoring. Mm. Uh, how do you price your product? How do you, uh, what customer features do you design it for? Um, how do you launch it? When do you launch it? Which geographies do you launch it? So that entire aspects of um, mentoring is such another another important piece. Um, and, and finally, I think they, these companies that they're starting up, they need infusion of talent. Uh, people can really build those companies uh, and start them up uh, effectively. So those we see as lack of access to capital, lack of access to, um, I'd say, uh, good technical advice and, um, and maker spaces and laboratories, um, access to mentors are big three blocks of things that we think are big gaps. And, and part of that is what we're trying to fill Correct. around seed funding, mentoring, talent and networks. The piece that we don't seem to be doing and the challenge that we have is an eye lens is very different from a ventilator and that's very different from a rapid refrigeration device. So uh, for that, what we're trying to do is network as much as possible with uh, technology providers, be it the National Chemical Laboratory, the IIT Madras, uh, the Agri Business Incubator at Equisat and places like that to access some of those technical inputs. Great. Great. So Harish, your story is a little bit different. You've created a company that's uh, had an enormous amount of impact in terms of delivering renewable energy products out into rural settings in particular, but also urban settings and, and beyond. And uh, the labs are now creating, you've created the Selco Foundation Labs, which are also working on creating the next generation of products that are needed by these uh, communities that you work with. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how being embedded in the community that you've been servicing with renewable energy products has helped to inform that work, how, how you work with them to create the next generation products, but also what kind of challenges you are facing in terms of bringing products into that community? Thanks, Carol. Uh, well, um, what we uh, uh, looked at was this 20 years of experience that we had uh, in, in providing energy access and especially using solar power. But what we found was that uh, um, not it was not always the products. Uh, it might not always be the business models, and not always be the financial model, but it's a combination of that actually leads to a better implementation uh, at the ground level. The, why I said fortunate for the 20 uh, uh, years of experience in Selco was which would not have ha had that what we created six labs in the foundation was uh, if you, if, as we say that we categorize the poor as three categories, poor, very poor and abject poverty. And all three categories n need different type of uh, product intervention, different type of financial intervention, different type of market linkage interventions. And the advantage of Selco India that we have today is most of my colleagues are non-English speakers. And, and today, I mean, in, in India, we have created English as another caste system because people who get the money are PowerPoint, Excel, and Word. The non-English speakers have no chance. And, and we said if we have to actually get to real innovation at the ground level, how do we have, it's not only a community, how do you listen to the community, but who listens to the community? Or, and a lot of our colleagues are from the community. So it's not the question about that we are going to a community. So it's, it's the part of the community which is already in as part of the organization. That is very critical because it's not, not you can do millions of surveys, but the question of, of a particular intervention, whether it's a product intervention, a financial intervention, or market linkage intervention, is are you able to, basically read between the lines what a person is able to say what the needs are. Today, what's happening nine out of 10 times, we go with a solution and try to fit a problem to it. And I think we need to break that. And, and that's when we said, okay, let's, let's create this foundation which, which has the six labs, the urban, rural. See, the urban poor have very different challenges. Not only you have poor, very poor, and abject poverty, 
Then you have to divide it into urban poor, rural poor, the tribal poor. And then the interventions could be in the livelihood space and the vulnerability space. So all these permutation and combination actually leads to different interventions that happen. Product-wise, very different. The way people perceive products at the ground level. And so the invention needs to be actually bottom up in the real sense. And that's the advantage of having 20 years of Selco. The challenges today, Carol, is primarily from the urban setting because such things are not taught in schools or colleges, mm -hmm. and especially in the IIMs and the IITs. Um, and, they, and that's how, how do we get that curriculum of sustainability and sensitivity to the poor and actually that community is not them, but its community is a partner. And then the, getting the partner onto the table and creating an innovation, the barrier is to today is the holistic thinking in our education system that actually leads to number of engineers and management and MBAs and all are coming up with a like a very modular thought process, not integrating the thought process saying that, okay, if I make a product viable, I also need to look at the financial innovation there and a market linkage that will actually make my invention much more productive at the ground level. How do we relook at education system in the country is actually the biggest challenge. Great, great comments. So let me turn back to Paul and um, ask you a question about, you know, Velcro has been involved in supporting invention-based companies. You gave a couple of examples, and, and you may um, be able to share some thoughts about what is unique around them. But also, you're in the process now of replicating the Velcro model into other locations around India, but then also into other countries. Can you tell us a little bit about what are the critical elements in terms of what the pieces are that you need to bring to the table, but also what makes fertile ground for that replication? Right. You know, I think um, when I look back at 2001 when Wilgo was founded, 2001 to 2000, I would say six, seven. Uh, I'm sure Vineet uh, and me have been discussing this quite a lot. I think it was a real tough uh, period. And I think it was tough because the 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 entire community wasn't really favorable to uh, a market-based model. Mm -hmm. But with, I think, microfinance really being successful in India, um, uh, with private capital playing a big role, with uh, people like uh, C.K. Prahlad writing the book Fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, I think there's been a big shift towards enterprises, um, more funding being available, with interesting fellowship programs, right? Um, uh, interesting train journeys like the Jagrati Yatra getting more people into uh, this space. I think there's been a significant change. Uh, now, beyond 2007 to now, I think a couple of things really define where uh, innovation-based incubator can set up, can be set up. And those are really the parameters that we look at when we are considering uh, another country for replication. Uh, point number one in my mind, if that country doesn't have a reasonably strong technical education system, which has, um, and I, I mean vocational training also, where people can get their hands dirty and build products and things like that, an appreciation of engineering, that's not necessarily the place where uh, a lot of that technical innovation can happen. Now, I'm actually a little bit biased towards hardware-based innovation when I'm, when I'm speaking. This does not mean that service-based innovation, business model-based innovations don't make sense. But I would look at that for sure. And why would I look at that? I would look at that for to make sure that I, have a, I would have a steady supply of innovators because that's the customers that we serve. So I would look at that for sure as number one. Number two, I would look at each country from an entrepreneurship perspective. So when we were thinking about, when we are thinking about Vietnam, uh, we've been hearing about how entrepreneurship in the commercial world is actually growing out there. And we're also starting to see some of these laws there, especially a social enterprise law that has been approved in, in Vietnam, which has not happened in India, surprisingly. Um, so things like that actually favoring the entrepreneurship ecosystem, which I think contributes two things to support early stage innovators. One, it brings in successful mentors who built companies in the past. Alongside what it brings is mentors. And mentoring is such an important component of an early stage incubation uh, activity. And if these two don't exist, early stage angel investors and uh, uh, mentors, it's, it's a tough one. 
So a country which therefore has a growing entrepreneurship ecosystem, uh, I'd really be uh, you know, encouraged about it. And finally, uh, the, these, these countries do need to have a sizable BOP population. Uh, and I'm not too sure whether it's the abject poor that most of these serve. I think it's one rung up, two rungs up, and therefore one of the indicators that we would look at is, is there a, 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 a trickling of wealth that's happening and therefore a lower middle class that's growing, which means it's not a perfect pyramid, but more of a diamond. Uh, the economy actually is more like a diamond and such diamonds are great places for us to replicate uh, incubator. Great. Um, Vijay, let me turn to you. You sit on the board of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry uh, Advisory Council on Innovation, and I know that um, they've been deeply involved, together with other key actors in India, in trying to create a more supportive ecosystem for entrepreneurship and, and also social entrepreneurship. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the approaches and uh, that are taking place around sure. that. Yeah, sure, Carol. Uh, basically, at uh, the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce, which is uh, FIKI for short, um, it's an industry platform where all the industries get together and kind of like deliberate and use it as a platform for uh, policy change, uh, communication with governments as a group, and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, both the industry platforms, we have two in India, which is one is the CII, the Confederation of Indian Industries, and FIKI, um, have been dominated by the larger companies. And um, uh, we've always been wondering, how do we uh, get a more inclusive agenda by involving uh, the small and medium enterprises, which uh, is basically, in most uh, economies, is the backbone of the economy. Um, but going beyond the small and medium enterprise, of course, is how do we uh, encourage early stage startup companies uh, like ours uh, to participate in the national agenda. And so therefore, what we did was basically we started up uh, a little group of people who thought about uh, the early stage enterprises and quickly realized that there are a number of problems uh, that face these companies and they are not really problems that uh, are within their own organizations or because of the lack of their understanding and experience, but there are problems that are related to systemic and industrial uh, related issues where um, you know, there would be intervention required either from the governments or even from um, the industry bodies themselves. And just taking off from where Paul left off, saying that uh, experience mentors is probably one of the biggest uh, contributors to the success of uh, early stage company um, we thought that this industry platform consists of people with, uh, I would say, thousands of years of, uh, you know, uh, wisdom. Uh, why can't we leverage some of that uh, in being able to nurture some of the early stage companies and help them through, uh, you know, the baby steps that they take at the uh, um, early stage of their growth? Uh, decisions in terms of that and, and then, of course, uh, patronage uh, and maybe customers. Uh, to a large extent. So um, this was uh, the intention and the early stage thinking of the uh, Advisory Council on Innovation. Besides that, of course, there were systemic errors in the uh, uh, financial as well as in the economic system within the country, which we could you know, uh, put up advocacies and, uh, and uh, negotiate with governments to change or make modifications or make suitable for small and early stage companies. So this is what the intention was. But however, to build a community, we started bringing together groups of innovators, groups of uh, people who intended to become entrepreneurs. Uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is fraught with a lot of questions and doubts in the sense that, um, will I lose my house? Will I lose my uh, uh, you know, assets as a result of my getting into entrepreneurial activity? When my children have to leave school, I can't pay the fees, and you know all those other issues that come in. So in personal insecurities were one of the biggest challenges. Besides that, of course, there were other elements within the ecosystem like building prototypes. And in the case of hardware, where do I go and get my uh, you know, prototype made or part made or things like that? So uh, we said, why, hey, why not use this platform to build uh, you know, an ecosystem also? And things that industries themselves can kind of solve this problem. So um, we've initiated a couple of programs. One is uh, called the Sandbox. 
Um, this came from the idea, I mean, or from the concept that India spends close to 1.2% of its GDP on public funded research, um, which is close to $10 billion if, uh, if you can look at it that way. And uh, this really doesn't have uh, the kind of necessary or the, uh, the kind of impact that we would have in terms of uh, social impact. Social impact in the sense as usable products or you know, improving quality of life in any way, not to any particular segment, but all across. Besides that, of course, it has not contributed significantly to the competitiveness of our small and medium enterprises. Um, how do we leverage that? And uh, the sandbox is basically a mechanism where we try to bring all this, uh, this kind of accumulated scientific research to some um, entrepreneur who would like to take it to the market and make capital out of it. The other uh, kind of activities that we do are uh, things like um, uh, hackathons, which is basically a fun time where all people get together, form teams, and over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, create something. And it's amazing to see how uh, you know, fast and quickly people can actually create something if they had things around them. So these hackathons necessarily, you know, have a little hack shop there where people can go and pick up things and you know assemble uh, stuff to uh, represent what prototype their ideas would like to have. And uh, this has, uh, I think, with Camtech, which is a well-meaning group of people from MIT, Harvard, and uh, uh, in the greater Boston area, have uh, conducted four or five hackathons uh, effectively here. And it's real fun. I tell you, you go to one of those hackathons, you'll be rejuvenated, you'll become 10 years younger. I mean, it's something that uh, we'd like to uh, tell everybody, just join in and be creative, you know. Great, great. Thanks for sharing yeah. that, actually. It's of interest. I'm going to close with a question to you, Harish, which is um, I want to ask you about, we talked a little bit about impact inventing having an element of uh, thinking about environmental responsibility. And so as we talk about hardware-based uh, projects and, and uh, creations that make solutions, they can also create part of the problem as, as you build them. They are the things that have the imprint on our planet. So maybe you can just uh, share a few words with us, uh, recognizing the time, about your thoughts about how one thinks about environmental sustainability in the context of creating environmentally or socially responsible um, products as well. Yeah, th thanks, Walter. This is actually a right question for the right time for this country, actually, in fact. Um, uh, because we are, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are grappling with this whole uh, question about uh, whether how, what, how should development happen? Should the environment be sacrificed? And development versus environment in many ways, right? But I think, uh, as as we are looking at uh, 300 million, 400 million more people, uh, less than a dollar a day, um, and as they are coming into the so-called formal economy, and more number of products actually get in. I think we have to be more serious about not uh, this serious about in general the type of products that we create, the type of uh, products we create, the the type of material that actually goes into each product that actually goes into today. Unfortunately, we are we are defining development in terms of pure consumerism, and 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 a lot of times what is happening, uh, Carol here is that we are we are looking at products that are cheap, so-called affordable. We are actually confuse the word affordability and cheap cheapness. Um, uh, a good, like an expensive product, which has all sustainable parts to it, where you can recycle every part to it, might be a little more expensive, but can, make, can be made affordable by having a good affordable financial product. But today, affordability means how do you make the product very cheap, in, rather than making it the ecosystem uh, affordable for the poor. I think inventors uh, need to look at uh, whatever design they're trying to do is each and every part, is it recyclable? Is it, is it coming from the local uh, uh, country itself? Because at 400 million people coming into the formal economy, we cannot sustain it in any manner that we can. And so I think we should, I mean, there are wonderful examples of that happening and, and you yourself have taken the lead of, of doing one of that. I think uh, more and more of such examples should come up. Great, thank you. So I know we're at the end of our time and uh, we're hovering over here. I want to make a couple of closing comments. I um, like to comment that I think you've heard here that there are a few different things that are really important to creating a path towards social innovation through product-based businesses as a solution. And uh, among those are the opportunity to identify 
what problems are worth solving, as well as focus on um, actually creating a path to create those innovators, those entrepreneurs, and then provide a supporting ecosystem. I want to point out we've supported at the Lemelson Foundation over the past year a few studies that might inform how each of you could contribute to creating a stronger ecosystem. And in fact, uh, sitting in the front row, here's my colleague, Philip. We've got a series of thumb drives with the studies on them, but one is actually about um, 50 breakthroughs, so top 50 things that could be addressed by science and technology and make a huge impact in terms of global development, looking at them not just from a technological viewpoint, but actually a business viewpoint and saying what are the barriers, what are the issues in terms of introducing them and making them into viable products. The second piece is a study that was done by our partners at Andy, which is looking at what are the critical barriers in the ecosystem to hardware-based companies being successful in delivering products. And so those include things you heard about today, which is how do you actually get the talent that you need? How do you actually identify what it is the consumer really needs, that end user out in the field and structure it appropriately? How do you think about finance? How do you think about access to physical prototyping spaces? And also, how do you think about policy? So those of you from the government, there are actually policies in place that encourage people to manufacture great ideas that are born and birthed here in India outside of the country because of the costs of bringing in raw goods and materials to build. So there are other policies that affect whether or not R&D is stimulated, et cetera. So something to think about for those in the audience. The third study I want to highlight we have on there is a promissory. We have a study coming out from our partners at Include that looks more deeply at the financial issues. What are the barriers for early stage financing for these companies? You heard a theme here about the gap in very early stage financing. So I'd encourage you to pick up, there's a thumb drive here with those on, otherwise to go to our website at lemelson.org and look under impact inventing. But I want to encourage all of you here in the audience that you all have a role to play in terms of creating a stronger ecosystem to support the kind of inventions and impacts we've heard about here on the panel this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you.